Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist and Science Fellow at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina. Our first map here is going to be an animation. We're going to start on April 1st and look at the top four inches of soil moisture. And we're going to go all the way up till today, June 7th. And as I just play this forward manually, we can see that we started off here with relatively saturated topsoil. But as we moved forward throughout the month of April, there were these time periods where we get eight or nine days without much precipitation. Then we'd have a system roll through and, and bring in some moisture like we saw here in mid-April. But watch as I go through the end of April and then into the beginning of May. By the end of April, we had our extended drive time period here. And then at the beginning of, or the end of April, excuse me, April 25th, look at the moisture that did return. Now watch what happens as we finally get into the month of May. Here comes May. And as I get out here at about the, let's go to the 15th, ready? From the 15th through about the 30th, look how dry things became. We had high evaporation rates. We had windy conditions at times, and this really took a toll on our crops. But as you all know, over the last several days, we have returned quite a bit of moisture. And as we sit here on June 7th, the satellite-derived soil moisture values uh, down at four inches are looking much, much better than they had throughout the month of May. I do want to bring up a point. It's very saturated in the southern plains of the United States. It's very saturated in the lower Mississippi River Valley. But we have pockets of drought that are developing here through the primary corn and soybean belt, and the west is extremely dry. So from there, I'd like to show you how much precipitation did fall over the last seven days. And we can see here that over the Carolinas, there are pockets here, six inches plus, a lot of rainfall was returned. And I wanna make a point, there's a cutoff load that spent much of the weekend over Texas and Louisiana. It's now moving through the Tennessee Valley. And it is going to be the source of our chances of rainfall through much of the next seven days, which I'll show you in a few moments. And we need this because if you look at the drought monitor that was released here on June 3rd, it had data available in it through June the 1st. Uh, you can see that much of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, we had already started to get into the third stage of drought because of how dry things had been there at that time uh, there in the end of month of May. Now, I got some pictures of what this looked like. Some of my friends down in North Carolina sent this picture here of the corn at the end of, uh, of May here, all rolled up tight, uh, really under a lot of stress. That rain that came through, well, he sent me another picture at the end of this weekend. That's the same area uh, that you just saw the previous picture. So it's amazing what these rains can do uh, when, when, when they come through like this. Now, from there, where are we heading? Well, you can see where that cutoff low that was over Texas is going to just slowly meander. And over the next seven days, we are forecast to have near normal to above average precipitation. Do take note that you come back here into the western corn belt for you corn and soybean farmers, okay? We're going to be very dry and actually very warm in this area. So that's going to be the region that's going to see the greatest stresses uh, over the next week. But the precipitation is coming through our area. I'm going to just take a moment to show you kind of why. So what I'm going to do here is let's set this resize. There we go. And what we've got here throughout the day today is we still have our larger high pressure cell that kind of extends from here all the way back out into the central Atlantic. And keep this in mind because at the end of this video, we're gonna do brand new long range update from the European model released this weekend. And we're gonna talk about this. But you can see the flow as it comes around. And as that flow comes around, it's just returning moisture to our area. What we had at times was this high was blocking that flow by sitting over the east coast in the mid-Atlantic. So this is the shift that we have seen. Now, I want to take you up a bit, and let's go up to 500 millibars. This is halfway through the mass of the atmosphere. And this is the slow-moving cutoff low that's just going to move its way over toward the Carolinas. Now, when I use that term cutoff, I want you to see a couple of things. First of all, we tend to get a closed circulation. Okay. The second thing is the main branch of the jet stream is here, and that's what it's cut off from. It has to get absorbed into that flow to move. And therefore, if it's not, well, all the strong winds are north of it. And it just slowly sits here and spins and moves just kind of gently to the east with time. So let's see what it does. I want to show you a kind of a national view of, of one of our high resolution models first. So you can see that as we go through the day today on Monday, we're just going to be watching across the state for scattered storms. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be scattered hit or miss storms. You do notice that the high res NAM model attempts to produce a heavier corridor of rainfall right in through here late tonight. That's what we're going to watch out for. But then as we go through the day on Tuesday and then even into Wednesday, it's just scattered storms as that cutoff low just moves toward the north and east. 
So from there, why don't we flip it over to the European model? I just want you to watch this next week, right? I'm going to do this relatively quickly. We're going through Monday. We're going through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. Did you just notice that every day we get these flashes of green? We've got open moisture transport. We have a trigger in the upper level low, and therefore we're just going to get daily convection, daily storms. And that's why if you like to look at the National Weather Service graphics, well, they look something like this right? So this is for Raleigh-Durham, and you just notice that every day there's a 30 to 50 percent chance of storms, and it's coming in on some heat. Look at the temperatures, 86, 87, 88, 91, 89. So we're still going to be getting that heat, but it's going to be very juicy, and the atmosphere is just going to pop in the afternoon. So while I can show you how much the models think this is going to be in terms of total accumulated precipitation, they're not going to be able to get this right. I'm just letting this play out through the end of this week and into early next week. In fact, let's just take it out to a full week's forecast. And if you just pause here and take a look at the precipitation totals, we're generally sitting from about an inch to upwards of two and a half inches. But you all understand how thunderstorms work. I know you do. And therefore, some of these storms could locally put down much more than that. And unfortunately, there will be places that miss out on this rainfall through the next week. This is our typical, you know, summer thunderstorm type type pattern. So we're going to watch this very carefully. Now, let's come back to those jet stream level winds. Today, there's our cutoff. There is the flow going to the north of it. And what I want you to watch is, as I get out here through this week, you see a large ridge builds here. And that cutoff low, which keeps some cloud cover and the rain around, well, we're still going to get some of the warmth from this, summer-like warmth, because the jet stream is so far to the north. But I want you to see what happens by the end of the week, because this little short wave right here will trigger some excellent upper level lift right here in the northern plains, returning some storms to that area. Now, why that's critical is because this kind of comes through and even pinches off this larger ridge that's been in the Canadian prairie. And the significance of that is that once we get out toward this weekend into early next week, that then becomes a broader trough through this area. And the ridge almost retrogrades, which means moves to the west and sets up right here for next week. So the jet stream level flow pattern is doing something a bit like that. Now what this tends to do is this tends to produce quite a bit of heat here. and We go back over to more normal temperatures over the east coast. But before we get there, let's at least talk about what this does to precipitation. Because as you can see, the GFS model keeps the ridge there as well. And the overall flow by day 10 is still doing something like this. So as we look out there into week two, what we get is better chances of precipitation south of this line. But where the ridge sits right in through here, and then the flow coming over it like that, we tend to get more upper level convergence in this area, and that tends to produce sinking motion and drier conditions. What we're gonna have to watch out for is do we just continue to get that flow coming around that Atlantic high, giving us better chances for daily storms. That's out to week two. Do notice how much of the western corn belt for you corn and soybean farmers is forecast to be dry. Let's go on out there and just take a look at those temperatures. Over the last week, we were cooler than average. All the heat was west and it was spreading into the northern plains of Canadian prairie. Well, as we move forward, that heat is going to remain here in the northern plains and at times spread across the whole northern tier of the United States. But this isn't a map of temperatures. It's a map of evaporation. Whereas we suffered through high evaporation rates in May, we now see our evaporation rates down here where we would expect them, even a little bit below uh, normal. So we're sitting at about an inch of total evaporation. Remember, that's a bare soil number, and this does not include precipitation, which is going to balance this out. But I just wanted to show you that where we're expecting some places in the Western Corbel to be dry and only some scattered storms in the Northern Plains, where you could see evaporation rates here that are going to really jump. And then come to the southern plains. For those of you that are growing cotton, right into this area, really right around Lubbock, for example, to Amarillo, we're going to see evaporation rates exceed two to three inches this week. So let's take a look at what those temperatures are going to do. High temperatures today, very seasonable. This is normal for us. All the heat, like I said, is to the north. As we go forward into Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, well, you saw it, a lot of upper 80s and possibly hitting some lower 90s. The extreme heat is here in the northern plains. But as the trough develops west, you now start to see the cool down that's going to happen there. So into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You just notice that throughout much of this week, we're not going to be seeing extremes on either side in terms of temperatures. It might be a little bit warmer than normal, but highs in the low 90s at most. And then by the weekend, we're talking about highs in the mid 80s. This is where the jet stream 
did that, remember? So there's the ridge and the heat that it brings. Now, just a lesson to learn here. These ridges that are happening here, they can also happen over us as well. We saw that earlier at the end of May, right? So we'll just keep an eye on this pattern as it advances forward. But if you notice out here, day five through 10, so this gets us out here almost to the middle of the month, the ridge is back west and that's where the heat's gonna be. It's gonna extend into the western corn belt. But notice the anomalies are not strong over us. And then even out there to day 10 through 15, where the atmosphere really wanted to just keep the ridge in place with that trough sweeping through, well, we're once again looking at near normal temperatures for this time of year. Now, this is where we get into the important part of this video, the long range updates. Let's first take a look at what the MJO is doing, because that's usually one of our best clues at subseasonal forecasting. But unfortunately, it's not providing much guidance. It's moving right into this area. Now, I understand the MJO is tricky to understand uh, and use if you don't look at it every day. But I want to remind you of something. It's when the MJO is way out here running around this diagram and it goes around it counterclockwise like that, that we have our most um, kind of our most extreme weather patterns, or at least it's the most predictable. When it hangs out right near this inner circle, it's not very predictable. And that's why when we look out over the next month and the time period I'm going to focus on here is June 15th to July the 15th. Do you see how the model is basically putting the pattern on kind of wash, rinse, repeat? It's got this area as shown up wet. We're drier back in this region. And the jet stream pattern just keeps wanting to do that. It just, it just perpetuates it. It leaves it in place. And I'm showing you this broader view of things for a couple of reasons. That high pressure cell I keep talking about, well, over that same time period, uh, the 15th of June to the 15th of July, it's still sitting here and it extends over to the east. So the surface pressure patterns are going to favor more moisture transport just like that. Temperatures, the models just leave in place almost what we've seen lately. So we're cooler along the coast, near normal over the Carolinas. The warmth is north and the warmth is west. So the longer range models are really just keeping what's been going on through the next month or so. Now from there, we need to extend this even farther. I'm going to first talk to you about the hurricane season. As a National Hurricane Season is, or excuse me, National Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on some tropical thunderstorms that are developing down here near Central America. They've only given it a 20% chance of development, but it's that time of year that we need to keep a very close eye on the Gulf and out here in the main development region, which stretches from, you know, the, the, the lesser and greater Antilles, which are these islands in through here, all the way over to Africa. And you see that those ocean temperatures in that area right now are warmer than normal. But what might be more critical to the long range forecast, which is what I want to finish with here, is the cool water that's still off the West Coast. Now, I've talked about this quite a bit, but we know how that increases the risk in the midsection of the country for drought problems. What I want to do is I'm going to show you the new long range European data, which was just released over the weekend. And you notice that for June, July, and August, it looks very similar to what I just showed you happening here over the next uh, couple of weeks and over the next, really over the next month. The models continue to keep this area wet and stormy and drier in this region. And even if I play it forward a little bit, let's go now, just let's get rid of June and look at July, August, September. Once again, that's the area that you see the wetter conditions and we're drier here. Now, do these models have really high predictive skill out this far? No, they don't. But what we look for in them is consistency. And we've seen that. It's been quite consistent with this pattern for a while. And we come back to asking those bigger questions as to why. And what we see here is if I show you the seasonal pressure anomalies, well, our high pressure cell is still here. But you notice the coloring. That would mean that the pressure values will be higher than normal where you get this color onto these shades. And what that tells me is that if this pattern just stays this way, we're not going to have any trouble keeping the moisture transport in place. Where when we go back over the last month, the big high parked over the East Coast and we got very dry. That's what the long range forecasts are sharing right now. What I'm getting concerned about, though, is what this is going to mean for our hurricane season. And we're going to have to keep a close eye on that. And I'd also like to show you this. Let's keep that high pressure cell in mind. And now I want to go back and I want to make a map for you or a graph, excuse me, that shows June through August. North Carolina precipitation all the way back to 1895. Now what you get is there's a lot of variability, but I put a trend line on the last 30 years. 
And over the last 30 years, while we've had some drier stretches in here, like at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, and then right here, in fact, we can look at it, 2007, that's a year we all remember, very, very dry. The trend, though, has been up over the last 30 years. Not much. It's about, uh, you know, about an inch, inch and a half. But what I wanted to do was then take the wettest years and see what they had to have in order to give us wet conditions. And this is what I learned. You have to have higher than normal pressure here. And there's two reasons that this is important. Any tropical system that forms off of Africa, and you see the lower pressure here, this means an active hurricane season. You see the lower pressure here, that means an active hurricane season. This high, called the Bermuda High, will steer these systems. And that increases the chances of us getting moisture from a Gulf hurricane coming out and exiting through the Carolinas, or a system that comes out of the Atlantic and moves into the uh, Carolinas. If there is no hurricane, it just still pumps moisture. So you need to watch very carefully where this is going to be. Disaster sets up when it is sitting right over us. In fact, it'd be worse if it got over like Nashville. That would be the worst place. But at the same time, this would increase the risk of any tropical system moving into the East Coast as well. So we're going to have to watch all of this, but at least now you have the latest updates. We'll wrap it up there. I look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks.